Well, hello, Brandon. My goodness, you were waiting for us. Saber. Hit the like button. That's right, Saber. I noticed you. Thank you. It's 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 okay. If they don't want to hit the like button, it's okay. I'm uh, pleased to have you with us tonight, everybody. Uh, it's 5.47 p.m. We're going to start the lecture at 6 o'clock. But in case you're curious, I always start this 10 to 15 minutes ahead of time just to make sure we're functional and gives me a chance to check in with a few of you and we test a few things out. Seems like every night we try something new. It's a little breezy tonight, so we'll uh, play with that a little bit, see if the audio is okay. I've got a new light right behind the camera. I have no idea if that will help. You know what, that's, that's what we will practice here in just a second. Let me get my laptop going. Thank you for joining us. It's a good, uh, good old-fashioned Ellensburg evening here. We got plenty of wind. This will be a good test to see if I have uh, everything strapped down appropriately. I do for the moment, but once I get rolling, you know, I start uh, tossing stuff into the grass, and that's when it goes away. Oh yeah, I wanted to practice um, a little bit of kind of macro zooming. And I think I'm most curious about to really get good focus with something that I'm bringing in. We'll be looking at some petrified wood samples tonight. Um, what's the most crucial element? Do we need really intense sun like we have right now? Or is it more of a, uh, you know, putting my hand up and kind of getting the mid-range focus to go and I don't expect to figure it out, but uh, let me practice with a couple of items and we'll see if we, if we can solve a couple things together. Let me, I'm not gonna grab any petrified wood. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, ruin the surprise. All right, well, let's actually start with this. This episode brought to you by Office Depot. Office Depot, dry east markers. Don't leave home without them. All right, so if I start here, and then if I just slowly push in, can you help me with, are we maintaining focus with that text the whole way? your hand behind the item if I want it to zoom. Still sharp, still sharp. Is that true? Is, is a background? Uh... Whoever said that, thank you. Get my face out of the frame, how dare you? I can't go two seconds without looking at myself. Come on, you know me better than that. Just kidding. Is it still sharp right now? I'm gonna hold it right here. 
and your comments are delayed a little bit so i'm going to have to wait for a bit so this is pretty this is uh acceptable sharpness okay good good yes good good yes yes good okay well that's encouraging let's try something that's reflective thank you for helping me early arrivals good enough john i need a little bit more out of you i think you're always the guy that underplays this john next time i want John, be who you are. So this one's a reflective, and I, I'm curious about focusing with something reflective. I'll try the hand thing, even though it's kind of dumb, but uh, I, I'm happy to follow orders. How are we doing here? Like the focus is, is snapping in. Keep an angle and it's good. Outstanding. Okay, now you got me excited. Now I'm going to come in harder. I'm, a, I'm not backing away now, okay? This thing is going to go into your living room. Do we ever lose the, the, the sharpness? I keep it in the sun there's no way that that's about as close as i can get why, why do i have a shadow here all right so that's helpful let me try one more uh, What if I have some kind of a dark background? What if, I, what if I use the clipboard? So what if I kind of just get the camera to somehow focus here? And So if you could help me one more time, ideally we'd like to see some actual reflective surfaces of the minerals inside of this um, igneous rock. So good, not good. Do you think the background helps? Camera will focus on what it thinks. Uh, okay, sorry, that was too fast. Pretty good. If I steer into the sun, can it handle me moving and rotating? Try my hand. If we just do that and I get my face out. Yeah, there's, thank you. There's, there's lots to practice there with um, shadows, obviously, with, I don't want to slow our roll here and spend like, you know, a minute like angling things in. So, like I say, we practice each time with something new. That was it for tonight. And um, I was mainly concerned because I have some of these petrified wood slabs that have a, a glossy sheen to them. They've been polished, basically, big kind of dinner plates. So I think I'll do a fair amount of that close-up stuff now. In other words, early on, because we got the good, strong light. And if I think of it, uh, I might try to do a little bit after the sun goes down. Yes, we're going to be here that long. And, um, and see if the low or the lack of uh, direct sunlight uh, diminishes the effect of the focus, or maybe it helps for some reason. All right. We got about three minutes, according to my watch. Uh, as always, can we uh, do a little check-in quick? I'd just be curious where we're coming from. SoCal, Vancouver, Washington. Great to see you. Wenatchee, hey, Mr. Photography. Jason, was it, I think? Super big fan of your work. Sweden, hello. Tacoma. Hilo, Hawaii, that may be Steve Horatio Lundblad. Uh, Ontario, uh, uh, sorry, 
Philadelphia, God Bar, I'd like to go there. Houston, Port Townsend, Leavenworth. If this is repetitive every night, I'm sorry, but I like to see this. It helps me get a sense. Uh, exotic Longview, Monroe. Yeah, we're mostly Pacific Northwest folks, and I understand the la this week. Melbourne, you're good. Australia, you keep showing up. Thank you for that. Grandpa Carl, you're from home, Dutchman. Thank you. Uh, Coopville. Yeah, so I, I think, um, haven't decided yet, but I think this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, we'll, we'll broaden things out again a little bit so that folks who want to watch from other parts of the world have a reason. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about Vantage Washington tonight. I mean, come on now. I mean, you may be into it, but I don't know. Would I be tuning in to watch something about some uh, tiny town between Warsaw and wherever? Uh, maybe the answer is yes. I don't know. So thank you for, for uh, checking in, and uh, let me get my thoughts together, and we'll get rolling. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to my backyard here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. So pleased that you're with us. Tonight, our topic is petrified wood. Have you ever seen petrified wood before in the flesh? Have you gotten your hands on some petrified wood? It's pretty bizarre stuff, wouldn't you say? It's just like it sounds if this is a foreign concept to you. It's wood from a tree that is no longer wood, but that wood has been turned to stone. It's been petrified. So you take the wood and you turn it into rock. And yet there's a remarkable precision, a remarkable preservation, I guess is probably the word I wanted, that is left over from that petrification process. I'm not sure that I understand the details of the petrification, but I do understand the regional context for the petrified wood here in central Washington. And that's the topic tonight, the petrified wood in central Washington. We're beginning to be going primarily to a little town called Vantage, Washington, which is halfway between Seattle and Spokane, more or less. And I want to come down here a little bit. And I think uh, we want to do a little show and tell right off the bat with the lighting conditions pretty good. I brought some petrified wood from the office to the home here. I've got quite a collection now of stuff in my backyard from our previous live streams. Um, I'm going to have to build a separate shed for all this junk I'm bringing home. But 
This has been energizing for me and, and hopefully helpful to you as well. So if you're new to us, 30 minutes of me, 30 minute presentation, and then 30 minutes of live Q&A. So hold on to those questions until then, and I'll try to get to them the best that I can. We have almost 300 people already. This is wonderful. I just glanced at the upper left-hand corner of my phone. So without further ado, let's get started. You wanna see some petrified wood? Okay. So we'll start with something that's one of my favorites. So we have hundreds of these polished slabs of petrified wood. I wish I could hand this to you right now and give you a feeling for how heavy it is. I know it looks like I'm holding a piece of wood that somebody went out in the backyard and they cut down a tree and they took a chainsaw and they, and they made a slab of the wood, but it's not wood, I promise you. I wish I could show you. Actually, I think I have a way to convince you this is petrified wood and not regular wood, but let's start with just kind of, so, so let me, uh, so I'm gonna push in and I'll keep my eye on the compens here for a second. You tell me if, if, if the focus is, is good or not. So I wanna kind of show you the tree rings without glaring too badly. How's the focus here? Are we doing pretty well? Good, fine, wonderful. Isn't this beautiful stuff? And I'll think I'll just keep rotating like this is a game show. Like you could win this if you figure out how many mice are in this barrel. And here's the back. Has a sample number, 55. And uh, I'll give you the backstory on, on who did the cutting here and why we have these samples in our department, but I'm, I'm gonna get greedy now. You still able to see some of this? Look at, look at these individual rings. I'll give you kind of a third dimensional look. Okay, so a piece of petrified wood. Now I'm not a botanist. You know what a botanist is, right? A tree, a tree expert, a plant expert who knows how to identify different kinds of wood and trees and everything else from the cell structure and from everything else. We'll talk about how the paleobotanists, the geology slash biology people, know how to identify this stuff in just a second. But it's still show and tell time. The light is good. Let me just give you a whole parade here. Now this might surprise you. This is petrified wood, but these are branches. So instead of a tree trunk, this is stone, but it's, it's, it's a branch of a tree. Now, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the date of this and when these trees were alive. That's all coming, but we're just trying to get you interested in this topic if you were kind of iffy on even tuning in. So this is kind of the rough look and then kind of a polished look. Okay, kind of a dud here. Although the preservation of, I wouldn't call this bark, but we're at least getting on the outside of this. Looks pretty good. Let me keep going. I don't know if this is like a, a pageant now. You gotta, you gotta vote for your best. This is like, I'm not gonna say it. All right, so. Yeah, there's kind of these flying slices. That reminds me of a, a two minute geology video that I did with Tom Foster a few years ago where he literally had these, he took a bunch of photos of these slices and then had them fly through the screen while I was singing. Or I guess while I was playing guitar. Two minute geology, two minute geology. All right. A little bit more of this, just trying to get you kind of uh, wet your appetite a bit. All right, so here's an impressive slab of some petrified wood. So this looks different, doesn't it? And uh, I think I'm gonna not do a whole lot more of this because I think it just looks like I'm showing you pieces of wood that you find in the woods or in a forest, you know? If you can't feel the heft to this, 
Uh, it may be underwhelming, but if I can get in here, push in, pretty good preservation. Okay. Last set. Now these have been identified. So not only you take a, 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 a trunk of a tree, cut the tree down, if it was a live tree, right? And make one of these quarter rounds. But let's look very carefully and realize that the expert tells us this is a cedar tree. And I'll tell you, these are trees that were alive 16 million years ago. So how in the world would we know this was a cedar tree? We have no leaves to look at. We have no acorns. We have nothing except a slice of the tree itself. But the point is, keep overusing that phrase. The idea is that you can look very carefully. You're kind of in the shadow of the camera now. You can look very carefully at the cell structure. So now this is biology class. Now this is a botany class. And you are carefully looking at modern wood and looking at those cell patterns. And then you're looking at petrified wood. And you're literally taking photographs or studying carefully the cell structure in the petrified wood, no different than the modern stuff. There's been no change in the basic structure of these woods in the last 16 million years. Last one I promise. So this is not a cedar, this is a cottonwood. You could tell me anything. I have no idea how, what we're looking at as far as cell structure is concerned but you get the idea. In fact, I'll, I'll mention the first gentleman tonight. I've got a few gentlemen to introduce to you to tonight verbally. About uh, 20 years ago, a gentleman named Tad Dilhoff uh, from an organization called Evolving Earth showed up, evolvingearth.org. And he's also an associate with the Burke Museum, which is a natural history museum at the University of Washington in Seattle. And Tad said, I heard that you just got gifted the Audie Turner collection. So there's another name. And the answer was, yes, I, I don't know anything about petrified wood. This is me talking, Tad. But I'd be happy to show you. We went down and lugged all that wood, all that petrified wood from Yakima, Washington, and we we brought it to our department and we promised that we would have a bunch of that petrified wood that's been cut into these slabs from the Audie Turner collection who owned a rock shop in Yakima. I promised that we would have a bunch on display for the public to enjoy. And I'm still using those slabs many years later. So Tad, who I didn't know at the time, uh, said, I would like to help you. I'd like to see the stuff first of all, but I'd also like to help you. So he had his Nikon old school camera, you know, back when we were using film and everything. And he, I, I watched him do this. I watched him kind of have his little tripod or quad pod or whatever, like establish his camera on top of the banquet table that we had. He zoomed in with magnification and was able to show that this is a hickory, this is a beech, this is a cypress, this is a maple, you get it, okay? So it's that kind of a story tonight. And you've already gotten the sense, I think, that I, have, uh, I don't have a lot of expertise with identifying wood. Uh, but I do have some expertise on the regional geology. And before um, we go much further, let me show you or tell you the two main things I'd like to do tonight. There is still a major mystery with the petrified wood advantage. And I want to set up that mystery and then show you where we are with the mystery. But it's a significant question that we still don't have an answer for. So that's always exciting when we have these unsolved mysteries. That means we need more geologists and botanists and everybody else to contribute. And uh, it's not a life or death situation, but it's a, it's a fun local question that remains. The other thing I want to do before we quit tonight is talk about a gentleman by the name of George Beck. And I'll tell you with just a quick introduction, uh, I've been here at the department in Ellensburg at Central Washington University since 1992. So we're approaching 30 years of that. And I'm hoping to teach for another decade or more if I, if God willing, get through this current situation. But George Beck was the geology professor here at this school 
from 1925 to 1959. And I used to think that was such a long time, and now I realize I've been here about as long as he has, or he was. But his specialization was petrified wood. And he did all the unique and special academic study at what is now Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park Advantage. So we're going to be looking back at George's work. And I recently, in the last year or two, met George's grandson, also named George. And there's a story there, and there's kind of a happy ending to that story. So I want to get to all that before we get to your question. Okay? So let's see. How can we tap into what we were doing last night? Do you remember what we were doing last night? The wind has died down temporarily. That's nice. So we were talking about these Columbia River basalts. In other words, flood basalts. And the dates started about 16.7 million years ago and continue till about 16 million years ago. Those are the new dates for the majority of the basalt. And I don't have Vantage on this map, but Vantage would be located about 30 miles to the east of Ellensburg. So that's where we're going today. So we were in the frame of mind of these flood basalts, and I'll do a quick recap. We talked about fissures. I'm, not, I'm pointing to them, but they're not on this map. Big cracks that, that opened up, and all this lava generally flowed west, coming out of those fissures. And we flooded the inland Pacific Northwest with lava, with Hawaiian-like lava. The petrified wood is all coming from one horizon in the German chocolate cake. Cue the German chocolate cake. I ate the section we had last night, tasted good. I still got more. This is the last of the German chocolate cake that was gifted about a week ago. Okay, so why am I showing you this? Probably for the last time. The German chocolate cake is a wonderful analogy to talk about all these flood basalts. And the maximum thickness is what? Three miles thick in places. Advantage, the German chocolate cake is about half that, maybe a mile and a half, something like that. Maybe even less, I kind of forget. Doesn't matter. Uh, I've done something with the inside of this cake, and I'm gonna show you that in just a second. No, I'm gonna show it to you now. I'm going nuts. Instead of playing with dolls and other things like I normally do, now I'm like playing with toothpicks and German chocolate cake. So what do you suppose I'm trying to show you inside of this German chocolate cake? What are the toothpicks all about? That's correct. These toothpicks are the petrified logs. There's only one major place in the German chocolate cake where the petrified logs that I just showed you, and we'll show you a few more samples coming in a bit, are coming from one horizon. Now you remember, there are 300 layers in this German chocolate cake, 300 brown layers. And there's only a couple of other horizons in the cake where there's a little bit of petrified wood. But for our purposes tonight, we're gonna just focus on one horizon. And I want you to look as carefully as possible um, at a couple of things. First of all, the non-chocolate layers are sediment horizons for us. You can think of as sandstones if you want or, or lake beds. That's fine. Either one of those is fine. And so notice that I don't have our petrified logs in the lake bed or in the sandstone. So I'm introducing a couple new concepts now. The main concept I'm introducing is that we still don't have precise dates on each lava flow in the German chocolate cake, but especially where we have sediment horizons, sandstones or lake beds, we probably have thousands and thousands of years of quiet after one eruption of basalt lava and before the next one. And so we really have, when you look at these kind of blonde layers, time capsules. 
a whole ecosystem got established thousands and thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years, maybe more. That's a long time. You're going to develop trees and lakes and animals, which reminds me. What animals are we talking about tonight? If we're talking about the petrified wood, good Lord, I can barely see. Can you see my face? I have to look at, oh, I can look at my profile. All right. Dinosaurs, way too old for our topic tonight. Our topic tonight is 16 million years ago. So we're noticeably younger than the dinosaurs. Get the dinosaurs out of your mind. Uh, do you know what mammoths are? Woolly mammoths or Colombian mammoths? Those are too young for our story. That, those animals were roaming around during the Ice Age. And by the way, I, I, I missed this until recently. People confuse dinosaurs and mammoths. I, I totally didn't think that was a thing. But, you know, I, I talk to a bunch of groups and sometimes I say, well, you know, there are no dinosaur bones in Washington. The first one discovered was, you know, less than 10 years ago. And everybody's like, oh, no, that's not true. There's, there's a dinosaur dig over here and over here. Those are all mammoth digs, but they just think big animal and they assume it's dinosaur. So you're probably a little bit more with it than them. And by the way, I'm sure they're experts in things that I know nothing about. So we're with our story tonight, which is a particular horizon with the toothpicks, the petrified logs, the petrified forest. Uh, we're too young for the dinosaurs. We're too old for the mammoths. And if you know that we have a bunch of palm fronds in fossil form, that's true. Uh, those are also too too old for us. Uh, there truly are uh, a couple places, well, there's one place where we're sure we had a rhino living here in central Washington. It's called the Blue Lake Rhino. That's a story for another day. But if you want to think animals living during the time of our cream, I'm going to call it a cream layer. If you want to think about animals living during, the, during our quiet time, during our time capsule time, during our forest time, think rhinos. Don't think dinosaurs. Don't think mammoths. Okay? Toothpicks? Petrified logs? Feeling okay? Let's add to it. Uh, there is a state park called Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park that preserves these logs for all of us to enjoy. So it's illegal to go and find those logs and uh, rip them out of the ground and take them home and put them in your basement. Uh, that was the game, by the way, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, but thankfully that's no longer the game. Okay, so what do I have for you here? Uh, at the state park, they came up with some new exhibits that they debuted last summer, the summer of 2019. And they did a really nice job and hired a, a wonderful artist. I think his name was Sam. And uh, this is a nice job of Sam to show us our toothpick. So this is a more realistic portrayal of some of these things we're about to talk about today. And in fact, I have a drawing as well for you. So I'm going to come back to this. I just realized... I want to convince you that the petrified wood I have is truly petrified wood. This is an idea I had, honestly, five minutes before I started the live stream. So we'll see if it works. I'm not going into the cake tonight. I stole this from our neighbor's wood pile. If they saw me sneaking into their yard 20 minutes ago, I got to go over and apologize after we're done here. Uh, but this is, well, I don't, can you help me? I don't know. Is this a beach? Is this a birch? Is this a, a poplar? I don't even know. But it's wood. How can I prove to you it's wood?
Can I prove to you it's wood? Does that work? Like I'm a woodpecker. Okay. Is this wood? I'm trying hard. No. You want to hear it land on the on the concrete? You want to hear the wood land on the concrete? Almost bounced up and hit the laptop. That was not smart. Okay, why am I making such a big deal about this? Well, if you're looking for something to do, and I guess we all are, if you go to YouTube and find a couple of two-minute geology videos that I did with Tom Foster about five years ago, one's called columnar basalt, and one's called petrified wood. Read the comments, and you'll see how entrenched Many are with alternative facts and their own version of reality. That's not petrified wood. That's not lava. Okay, let's leave that alone. Let's pick up the pace. Yep, we got to pick up the pace. Too, too much screwing around. Um, so here's my uh, diagram for you. Uh, zeroing in on where the toothpicks are. I don't have to get the German chocolate cake again, do I? These green things are the toothpicks. What are the toothpicks? They are the petrified logs that are coming from one horizon in the German chocolate cake. We've named the lava flow that has all of the petrified logs in the base of it. It's, we call it the ginkgo flow, the ginkgo lava flow. But there's a name we have for every other lava flow as well, not worth doing that tonight. Notice that right below the ginkgo lava flow is this thing we call the vantage sediment. And we'll talk more about that vantage sediment in just a second. But please note, this is the cream layer in the German chocolate cake. Please note there's no wood, not even twigs, not even acorns. Nothing is petrified from the actual lake bed itself. That is a surprise once you hear the basic story coming. And I promise I'm picking up the pace now. So when George Beck, the guy who discovered these logs and started studying them and started publishing papers, published in journals that his petrified logs were coming from the base of a lava flow, nobody believed him. This is back in the 1930s. It wasn't exactly easy to fly up here and take a look. But he had a very hard time convincing people that this was a thing. And they basically said, well, how can you have petrified logs in a lava flow? They wouldn't survive the heat of a lava flow. That stuff's like a thousand degrees centigrade. And his answer is, if you take the time to come to Ellensburg, we'll go over to Vantage and I'll show you. We're pulling these logs out of the base of the lava flow. And these black circles in between the green logs, they're not green in real life, of course, are pillow basalts. And we've already mentioned briefly that pillow basalts mean that there was water present when the lava flow came into the area. So think very hot orange lava going into a lake and all sorts of steam and all sorts of logs that were in the lake and protected by the water. That's why those logs didn't burn up. And then the aqueous environment and the heat allowed for mineral transfer and substitution of those cell patterns. That's the part I don't know much about. Notice that we have other lava flow layers here. They don't have any wood in them. Notice that some of the lava flows don't have pillows because they erupted onto dry land. It's common to have columns forming in lavas if the lava doesn't have a pillow zone at the base. The little dots on the top of each of these flows, I forgot to do it up here, are the little gas bubbles called vesicles, so the bubbles are rising to the surface. 
Okay? So that's the story at Vantage, Washington. The Columbia River and the Ice Age floods ripped into the German chocolate cake and exposed in massive sheer walls this very famous spot. But this horizon is not just at Vantage. It's at many places exposed in the Yakima River Canyon south of Ellensburg. It's exposed at Clyde Friends Place up on top of Yakima Ridge. It's exposed in many places. But for our purposes tonight, we'll just say Vantage because that's the most famous and obvious place to find these logs. Okay, I promised two more things before we go to your questions. One is, what's the major mystery? We haven't gotten to it yet about the logs. And that's what I want to do on the chalkboard. And two, uh, what's the backstory about George Beck and what's my connection to his grandson and why is that even worth mentioning? Okay, so to the chalkboard we go. Back in Beck's time, and again, we're talking the 1930s and 40s when he did a majority of his work. And again, he had his critics because of this wood story coming out of lava. But the amazing thing is that when he was taking inventories of all these logs that he was pulling out of the base of the vent, excuse me, the base of the ginkgo flow and uh, at the very, very, no, at the base of the ginkgo flow within the pillows, he was identifying the wood. He was making thin sections. He was looking carefully at the cell structure, just like we did, George Beck now in the 1930s. And in his published reports, he made a roll call of the kinds of trees that were all at vantage, like all the toothpicks, or all these green logs, not the same species of wood. And you're like, okay, well, there's a couple different kinds. Here's the inventory of tree types in other words, kinds of woods, kinds of petrified wood at vantage at that horizon. I'm yelling now because I'm excited. Ready? Roll call, wood types at vantage. Cypress, hickory, walnut, elm, oak, birch, beech. What are we doing? We're talking about the different kinds of petrified wood that's literally within a mile of each other. They're all sitting there next to each other in place. Sweet gum, tupelo gum, cedar, spruce, sequoia, I'm not making this up, chestnut, Douglas fir, ginkgo, maple, pine. Now even I know that those are different kinds of trees that grow in different kinds of conditions. Are you kidding me? A cypress tree found right next to a Douglas fir? next to a redwood, next to a spruce, next to a walnut, next to a cypress, next to a sequoia. You can't imagine a forest with all those different kinds of trees growing in place. So here's the biggest message of tonight that opens up the biggest question. None of these trees that are petrified logs at Vantage grew advantage. I'll repeat. There are no roots with any of these guys. They all show signs of transport. These are tree trunks that got moved, got battered around. Uh, there are some branches and twigs that I showed you, but there's not a ton. These things got transported by something from somewhere. That's the mystery. How do you take all these different kinds of trees that need from swamp to subalpine environments and get them all clustered together before the ginkgo lava flow comes over and buries everything and petrifies them? That to me is the interesting question. And it's not just, and it's not just me, it's a lot of people. So how can I use the chalkboard to summarize the thoughts that have been out there so far? Have you heard about this question? Have you read kind of the answer? If it's been written as an answer, that's not appropriate because nobody really has a good feel for it. I'll be quick. Beck, who did the original work and still by far the most detailed researcher of these woods, these tree trunks, 
uh, in central Washington was a fan of all of the trees coming from the north. So he had to explain all these different kinds of trees, advantage, and his main thought was those trees got transported by river systems, the old Columbia, remember, and some other river systems, maybe even coming from British Columbia, but definitely coming from the Okanagan. And there's enough elevation difference that he thought that he could get different kinds of trees all showing up here. So he was imagining big floods of rivers, not Ice Age floods, remember, we're way too old with our story here, and Beck knew this. Actually, I don't know if Beck knew much about J. Harlan Bretz. That's, a, that's an interesting thought. Huh. So we're too old for the Ice Age floods. So Beck was not writing about the Ice Age floods for sure. Uh, so he's talking about uh, the river of the north, basically. And I don't remember, to be honest, what else he was using as evidence that everything was coming from the north. Maybe he was looking at cross beds within the sedimentary horizon. But remember, there's no petrified wood in the sediment itself, in the vantage sediment. So you can do all the work... You can do all the work you want to do in the vantage sediment, that's fine. But I keep coming back to the fact if there's no wood in the vantage sediment, then does it really have an impact on how those logs got here? Okay. Uh, that, that's kind of done with Beck. Temporarily. The other idea that's come up, I guess in the last 20, 30 years, and maybe it's what you've read, if you went to the state parks, I think they talk more about this. They say, how about those trees came from the Cascades and not the Okanagan? So Beck wanted the trees to be brought to vantage from the north. More recent work in the last, let's say, 50 years has implications that the logs were coming from higher elevations in the Cascades and brought down. But there's a difference with the Cascade story. Were these also river floods? Like Beck was visualizing, the Cascades people say no. They say, how about you bring a volcanic mud flow? A lahar. You know about those? If not, we'll talk about them soon enough with this backyard series. Lahars, as we've witnessed with Mount St. Helens 40 years ago, for instance, carried a bunch of logs, ripped up a bunch of trees, and carried them in this slurry of liquid concrete down the Toodle River down past the I-5 bridge. And so the thought was, are all these logs advantage coming from the Cascades via a lahar instead of a river? Well, you, again, you can look carefully at these inter individual little beds, and each of them are graded beds. They look like little debris flows, but there's hardly any pumice. There's a little bit of a pumice-rich layer at the very top of the vantage, which may help your case for the Cascades. But for the most part, I think you can argue, argue either way. Okanagan, source, rivers, or Cascades, rivers. My main point is we don't have these big logs encased in volcanic mud flow to make it an easy uh, open and shut case. So more work needs to be done. How many people have been working on these petrified logs? Probably less than 10 in the last 70 years. I'm not kidding. It's haven't been looked at very much. And Dillhoff and his brother uh, started EvolvingEarth.org to try to promote uh, student research. But it's not a common specialization, even for us here at Central Washington. Uh, oh, man, I'm after 6.30. Uh, let me give you a, a very quick version of the George Beck thing, and then if you want to ask about that, we can go a little further. I have some photographs of George Beck. Stern-looking guy. He's the guy that discovered all this wood, did all the study, 
He's the guy that liked the Okanagan as the source. Here's stories, uh, photos. Uh, here's George. Here's George Beck's grandson, named George Mitchell. And this is the guy that I met two years ago. So I'll make it quick. I knew that George Beck was the main geologist at Central. Uh, I kept hearing about him. I kept reading his old journals and things like that. And I wanted to make a display about the history of our department, but I didn't know any relatives of George Beck. And then somebody a couple of years ago said, well, George Beck's grandson works in Yakima. He's like retirement age, but he's still working. He owns a saddle shop right behind the Fred Meyer on 40th. Why don't you go down there and visit with him? And so I started going down and visiting George Beck's grandson named George Mitchell. And over the six months or so, I got to really enjoy my visits to George Mitchell. And it got to a point where he started giving me original photographs that were passed on to him from his grandpa. And I'll finish with this. And again, we can talk more about it if you want to ask about it. Photo of Beck and some associates doing the original surveying back in the early 1930s. Ginkgo State Park today, these big logs that have been salvaged uh, from putting in the I-90 and other uh, kind of excavations are now protected. You can walk right up and put your hands right on it. I actually had a thought that I would do a field trip with you tonight and go over there, but uh, the park is closed. Uh, artist rendition from the new uh, exhibit at the state park, kind of giving us the idea of that lake so I failed to mention that it's pretty great evidence that there was a, a lake vantage where these logs were carried to the lake and then the lake was having these logs, kind of like Spirit Lake today. The logs were floating in it and submerged. And then even when the ginkgo flow came in from the east, the ginkgo vent is over here. So the ginkgo flow came in, buried the logs. There was a lot of logs protected by the water. Some precious photos from the grandson, George, of Beck when he was teaching at Central. This is from the late 20s. George Beck on top of Steamboat Rock. The late 20s, they're taking field trips with cars. Like there's hardly any roads back then. We really need to increase our style like these guys had, man. George Beck is in the middle there. Thank you to George Mitchell for the wonderful, here's, here's George, who was also a music professor at Central. So here's George around the campfire playing a fiddle, I believe. You can see better than I, perhaps. George Beck in high school, 1911. All right, am I done? No, I got one more thing. So in the early 1990s, when I moved to Central, there was a professor named Dan Beck, and somebody gave him the copies of the copies of the copies of George Beck's original journals. And that's all we had, copies of copies of copies. And Dan's like, you want these? I don't, I'm not, I don't even know who this George Beck guy is. I'm, I just happen to have the last name. So for 25 years, I had copies of copies of copies of George Beck's part, partial journals in this Scrabble box in my office. And then I met the grandson two years ago. And as I developed more and more trust with George Mitchell and kind of gave him a sense of what I do and what I'm trying to do, one of my last visits down there, George is still with us, by the way. The last visits down there, George said, uh, well, 
I've been sitting on these for a long time and nobody else in the family really has a lot of interest. And so I think I want to give these to you. And they're the original journals. The, the original journals, George Beck passed away in early 1980s. Nobody had seen these journals. The folks at the Burke Museum had a bunch of Beck's wood, but didn't have the information to go along with those. And so grandson George Mitchell graciously said, you're the better person to have this than me. Once I go, nobody's gonna know about these journals or they're gonna get thrown away or whatever. And so I had the original journals for a while. I brought them over to the Burke in Seattle. The Dillhoff brothers were excited. Tad made copies, uh, gave me copies. And now the original four big journals by George Beck are over at the Burke Museum. And that's the place they should be because much of the wood is over there. And last May, when we could still travel and do things, uh, George, the grandson, George Mitchell from Yakima, Ted Dillhoff, we went and saw all of the original stuff that is still in the back rooms of the new museum over at the Burke. And it was a pleasant day for everybody to see that. So it kind of was some closure uh, between the journals and the samples and the handwritten, you know, George Beck worked really hard on this stuff all through the 1930s and 40s. And so it was fun to be the middleman for some of that. Okay, that's a record for length. I did, wasn't planning on going that long. Thank you for your patience. Uppercase, put the caps locks on. Uh, I'll go as quickly as I can with at least 15 minutes of questions. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm going to scroll back and do my best. What is the date range for the logs? They're just from the bottom of that. So there's just one flow, 16.1, 16.1 million years for all the major logs. I have to say there's a couple other petrified wood horizons that have different ages, but they're not major forests. And so I'm choosing not to focus on those. Is there charring on some logs? I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. There have been some bark found, petrified bark, petrified acorns. These are rare, of course. Ray Foisey in Yakima has been collecting those things from this time horizon. Again, even if you find a stand, what looks like a standing tree, there's no root. So as I understand it, the vertical logs just happened to be vertical. They were transported and then got swept up into the base of the, of the ginkgo flow and just happened to be vertical. Now that's a hard thing to convince people, but we don't have evidence for them being in growth position, quote unquote. Was there a channel for some time as Seletia Dock? Seletia Dock is too early for this story today. Were the processes the same that created the Petrified Forest National Park? That's in Arizona a famous place for petrified wood. There's no lava there in Arizona to paint that petrified wood. And that's why George Beck had so many critics, uh, but I don't know the details of the petrified wood down there, sorry. Is there petrified wood at craters? Mark, what about craters of the moon? There's gotta be a ton of craters of the moon. Mark W. Keller. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty funny, actually. Are they now digital and online? They are not. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good idea. I'll ask Tad if 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 somebody wants to do that. I, I don't I don't know. You know, I haven't even been to the new Burke yet. We went over when it was still being built. Uh, there's so much they have at the Burke Museum that I'm sure if you go over. When we, when we get back to normal, you won't see any petrified wood, but it's there back and there's, there are some researchers doing things. Are comparisons to other petrified forests? I'm sorry, I don't know. Do all the lava flows fill a hole in the ground? Didn't the Deccan traps also fill a hole, possibly an impact crater? There is, that's more of a flood basalts question. There is talk of a tie between flood basalts and impacts, but um, 
a hole, filling a hole in the ground, not, no evidence for that here. Patrick is curious, when you decided to become a geologist and why? Thank you for continuing to ask that question, Patrick. Um, I'm a late bloomer. I had no interest in geology until I was 21 years old. 21. No interest in science, no interest in geology until I was 21. In 21, I worked in Glacier National Park pumping gas at Lake McDonald Lodge. Had the best summer of probably my life, socially and otherwise. I saw things that summer on hikes. I'd never lived in the West before. And I happened to visit Mount St. Helens in 1983, the summer of 1983, and was very impressed. And I've been thinking about geology ever since. Still wondering how the various tree species ended up together. Yeah, me too, Joseph. Was there evidence of tree molds as well as the base of the lava flow? No, the, these, 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 whatever, um, th think of the toothpicks in the cake, they're all floating in the lava. None of them are even at the base of the ginkgo. They're all up within the pillow zone, and that pillow zone is probably 20, 30 feet thick. Just lost the sun, starting to get cold. Uh, are there any petrified bones? None that I'm aware of. The rhino uh, fossil at this time is actually a, is it a mold or a cat? I guess it's a mold. A mold of the dead rhino in the lake covered by lava, also preserved because the lake water. No bones. Uh, is the area of sediment layer the same size of the flood basalts? I kind of drew it that way, but uh, the vantage sediment on, on average is, I would say, 25 feet thick, and each lava flow is about 50 feet thick, half as thick. Why couldn't the wood be coming from both the Okanagan and the Cascade? Sure, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, now that I think of it, uh, there's mica, yeah, is this appropriate? Yes, uh, there's a bunch of mica, fresh muscovite mica, and maybe some biotite too, in the vantage sediment. And those that know the Okanagan bedrock well say that that's a smoking gun for Okanagan that if you got a bunch of Muscovite mica in Vantage, it didn't come out of the Cascades. I'll take their word for it, I don't really know. Can the season of the year be determined by the moraines? Not that I'm aware of. Could zircons help locate the source of the Vantage sediments? Yeah, I think it could. Yeah, many of you are aware of this relatively new technique where you, send, you pull out a zircon mineral and the zircons record amazing data and you could play a matching game between the zircon chemistry and ages and the bedrock in either the Okanagan or the Cascades. That's probably something somebody should do if somebody really wants to get interested in this. How many flows above and below? Well, the Ice Age floods came in and ripped away so much stuff that when you go to Vantage, there's just three or four lava flows above the Vantage, but there used to be many more. And below, I would say, at Vantage, a hundred lava flows all the way down to the base of the German chocolate cake. Thank you for the questions. Was there evidence of tree molds as well at the base of the lava flow? Nope. Uh, are the logs found in groups or are they spread out? I guess there's some clusters here and there, but it seems pretty uniform in the exposures that I've seen and have kind of read about. So I wouldn't think of a big kind of beaver dam kind of, I know you're not saying that, but I wouldn't think of a huge cluster in one place. Uh, might, uh, Patrick, was there a volcano in the Cascades that erupted at the right time? That's a good question, Patrick. Um, I don't know of an, ob we're going to talk about ghost volcanoes in the Cascades, maybe this weekend, I'm not sure. There's not an obvious volcanic source in the Cascades that's the right age. That never thought of that. Very smart. Good job. Do I think it was aliens? Can't rule it out. What? Cypress would change to fur going up a mountain, possible giant landslide. No physical evidence of a giant landslide. You'd expect to see some kind of deposits. We can tell if a landslide happened based on the jumbly nature and the poor sorting and everything else. 
That's the weird thing. In the Vantage sediment, uh, there are these a dozen perfectly well-behaved little debris flows that are kind of like, like miniature landslides, but they seem like they're just floods from river sources. I'm going backwards now. How did the Boy Scout tube whole trees evaporate, vaporize, but these trees turn to stone? I don't know about the Boy Scout tube hole. I'm sorry. What is it with geologists and music? Who is tomorrow's special guest? We are talking about Liberty Gold tomorrow. Please talk about the mechanisms of petrification. I know very little, Eva. All I can say with confidence is that to have petrification, you need heat and water and an exchange of minerals. And the minerals are soaking into the wood and replacing the organic cells. That's the extent of my knowledge. I wish I had more to say. Uh, in an intelligent level there. Maybe that's why I'm eating alive on those YouTube videos, but probably not. It's like people around the, people in Russia are like convinced. Uh, uh, is the date based on the lava or the logs? The lava, you can't date the logs. How do we explain the large variety of species? Yeah, that's the question, we don't know. What is your pl favorite place to hike for geology close to Ellensburg? Evelyn. Hello, Evelyn. Nice to see you again. Oh, it depends on the time of year. Um, I like hiking in the Yakima River Canyon when it's too snowy other places higher up. I also like going out into the channeled scablands where the Ice Age floods happened. Can uh, A couple more and I think we're done tonight. Scrolling backwards. Still having scrolling problems. Uh, maybe that's it. Maybe it's good that I went 45 minutes. Uh, how about photos of the log holes in the road cuttings? I don't have any photos of those, but if you know the drive between Ellensburg and Vantage and you're heading east, and you know where the rest area is, halfway between Ellensburg and Vantage. That's ryegrass, right? Look real carefully on the south side of I-90, about milepost 133. I think that's the right number. Milepost 133. And you'll see the Vantage sediment, and you'll see the Ginkgo lava flow, and you'll see holes. When they put the freeway in in 1970, they snapped off those logs and threw them in the back of a pickup and I think brought them down to the state park, I'm not sure. And somebody I know illegally stopped there with Tom Foster. I crawled into one of the holes. Tom took a bunch of photos and we didn't end up using them. Uh, but it was a, there's, so, so don't stop along, whatever. Disclaimer, disclaimer, the holes are there. You'll see them if you look. Uh, thanks for inviting us all over for a beer and a lesson. We love you too. Logs and floating spirit. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. I think that's enough. Um, I am talking tomorrow night and then we'll take Friday off. Our routine is, is five of these a week. Nothing on Mondays and Fridays. That's the schedule I've come to. I still don't know what I'm doing this week and... But uh, you are certainly welcome to join us tomorrow night, 6 o'clock Pacific. Tomorrow night is Thursday night, March 26th. We are talking about Liberty Gold. And I got a phone call from a gold miner who's a friend of mine and said, Hey, been enjoying the live streams. Would you like some samples to do some show and tell? So he'll be here helping us out. A toast. Here's to you. Here's to your health. 
Here's to the health of your parents and your grandparents and your children and your grandchildren and your friends and all of us on planet Earth. Here's to you. Cheers. Thanks for joining us tonight. See you tomorrow night. Love you. Goodbye.